Good afternoon everyone uh, and thanks for joining us for this webinar on cow comfort and lameness prevention in house systems with Professor Dan Weary. My name is Erica Oakes and I'm the Program Development Manager here at Dairy Australia. Uh, I predominantly work on our Healthy Hooves program, so our lameness program, and um, we've got Dan in to have a talk about um, cow comfort and lameness prevention in house systems. So before we start, um, just have some housekeeping for you all. This, ep this webinar is going to be recorded and it will be available to watch again on the Dairy Australia website. If you have any questions, just type them into the um, box on the left hand corner and as they come up, I'll read them out and, and Dan will answer them. So we're happy to take questions throughout the presentation. Um, so I'll just introduce Dan before passing over to him. So Dan Weary is a professor at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Uh, in 1997, Dan, Dan co-founded UBC's Animal Welfare Program and co-directs this active research group. Dan's work on dairy cattle focuses on the housing and management of dairy calves and cows. His work on cows has focused on improved comfort, especially in stall design and management, and how these ch changes can benefit cow health, in particular lameness. So on that note, I'll pass over to Dan. Thanks very much, Erica, for the introduction, and, and thanks to you and Dairy Australia for the opportunity to, to be able to do this webinar and to, uh, uh, over the webinar at least, to get a chance to meet some of your uh, your uh, local producers and people in the industry. So great pleasure to be here. So yeah, it's a, uh, nice to be able to tell you a little bit about the our predominant systems. The the region of Canada that I'm in, we ha almost all of our cows are in uh, free stall barns, um, and that's also be the predominant form of housing for for much of that uh, western region of of Canada where I'm in. Um, I've been working for almost 20 years on issues around cow comfort and. Um, I, I, none of that work would be possible if it wasn't for the support of our uh, local uh, dairy industry. And so I've just got our very first slide come up as sort of our thank you slide, which basically acknowledges the support from uh, Dairy Farmers of Canada, which is, I guess is roughly our equivalent of Dairy Australia, um, that, uh, that kind of supports our work as well as a bunch of the other people, uh, big players in our, in our, in our dairy industry. Um, and uh, it, because of, of, of that support, we're also our own research farm, I'll show you pictures of in a second, are, is based right out in the heart of, of our local dairy industry. We get a lot of, of contact with farmers um, and a lot of the questions we have come around to how to, if I'm going to spend all this money in terms of building a cow palace, one of these beautiful barns, how do I get this to work in a way that, that works for the cows? Um, and just to get a little bit more of a sense of who you are as audience members before before I get too far along, we've got the next slide is a is a is a poll just to just to tell me a little bit about what your experience with how systems is. So if I could just ask you to respond to that question on the screen, um, to get a sense of uh, of where people sit. Great. I think we'll, yeah, we'll pull that along. That's great. That's a nice uh, mixture of of expertise. Some people just sort of starting off with their first experiences, um, and uh, and and some people with a bit of experience, and a few people with with lots of experience. So I, I really look forward. I hope we'll be able to give you some information in this talk that's going to be helpful for you wherever you are now with your house ex with uh, with your work with house cows and I look forward to your questions too at the end to see if there's anything at all on this topic you want to throw my way I'll, I'll have a go at trying to answer it for you and so next slide please there we go so yeah I, I promised I'd show you a little picture of, of what uh, of what our farm looks like. So that's the, on the top right hand corner is the, the uh, outside of the farm. That's our main milking parlor. Uh, we're in a very pretty region of British Columbia surrounded by mountains. And then there's a picture of the inside of one of our main barns. Uh, and it looks very much like what you'd find almost anywhere in the region, these uh, uh, big open sided pre stall barns. Um, and the trick is, of course, to get them to, to work for the cows. Uh, these barns often look beautiful, but there are real problems in, in managing them in a way that, that works well for the cows. And I'll, I'll walk you through some of the things you can do to try to hopefully, as you move into house systems yourselves, 
uh, or work with the health systems you're working with, you can try to uh, inherit fewer of our North American problems. Um, There we go. This is a, an, an, uh, just a, a close-up of our, of our indoor of our barn, and we'll just go. Okay. So um, one way to start uh, with this is uh, in, in in almost any assessment, and we're talking about this a little bit, and over lunch, uh, just getting ready for this today, is is if you're thinking about uh, switching to this type of facility yourself, is to get lots of experience in other people's facilities seeing some of the common mistakes that are out there. And I think the trick, and this is even if you've been working with house cows for many years yourself, is to take the time to look carefully at your animals and see how they're interacting with their environment. And so um, what we have here is a uh, just a little loop video of a cow standing up or lying down. It's one of the most important things you can do in is look at your animals, interact with their environment, and in one of the most important behaviors they're doing, which is of course spending time lying down. Well, in order to lie down, you got to be able to lie down. And in a freestall environment, there's a whole lot of hardware you have to interact with. And if you watch carefully this cow, you'll see her actually hitting that little uh, metal wire in front of the stall. Uh, and actually, if you take your time to look at the cow, you'll see a lesion on the back of her neck. Even if you close your eyes and you sit in that barn, you'll hear the noise of the cow standing up and lying down and interacting with the hardware. And any of those three things, so looking with your eyes, listening, and then looking for evidence on the animal of either shiny spots on the animal, hairless spots on the animal, or uh, if you look, actually put your head in the stall and look up, and you see shiny bits on the stall surface, that tells you the animal hitting the salt surface, and that's always a mistake. Um, you can also just look around a farm. These are all things you should never see. Here's a cow lying in a, in a part of the alleyway. You just shouldn't see this in a well-designed uh, indoor environment. Here's a cow just caught up in the weirdest possible way in an old sort of homemade uh, stall. Here's another old homemade stall of a cow doing this dog sitting behavior. These are all things you should absolutely never see. And if you see them, these are unacceptable. Uh, here's one which you will see in free cell environments, but you sh still shouldn't. There's actually a couple of interesting things going on here. One I'll come back to many times is the surface the cows line on here. If you can see the surface that the cows line on, there's a problem. The bedding should be fully covering it. Uh, you can see the cow hanging halfway out of the stall. In fact, she's lying sideways in the stall. If you look at where her back feet are, it's going to make sense to you why the cow is trying to lie in this awkward manner. It's because there's not enough room for her to lie down. She has to lie down sideways to get even her back end lying on the surface at all, and even then her back feet are hanging out of the stall. So uh, all indications of something gone horribly wrong at the stage of when the stall was designed. There we go. Um, okay, so um, the, uh, th there's an, a, a number of, of uh, in, in addition to just uh, that careful, slow observation that anybody can do by walking onto one of your neighbor's farms uh, is, um, is, uh, is um, it, it, we can also, of course, look at these kinds of uh, behaviors, the way the animal interacts with their environment in a more systematic manner. And, um, on this slide, you see three different classes of behaviors that I want you to be thinking about. These are all important aspects of cow comfort. The one on the left, I think, is the one that we think about most often when we think about cow comfort, and that is that we've provided the animals a comfortable place to lie down. And that's super important. We're going to talk a little bit about that. But in addition, let's say in a well-designed environment, the cow's spending about 12 hours a day lying down. That means she's spending 12 hours a day doing something else. And she's for that 12 hours, she's going to be on her feet. So even if we're just looking at the stall itself, the cubicle itself, the cow will spend a certain amount of time standing up in the cubicle. For some people, this is a mistake. The cow should never be standing on the cubicle because what can happen if the cow is standing fully inside the cubicle is that when she defecates and urinates, she's doing it inside the stall and she's, and she's contaminating the bedding. However, and this is a very important first thing for you to think about when you're thinking about indoor environments, is we want a comfortable place for the cow to lie down in, but because she's spending also 12 hours a day standing up, we also have to have a comfortable area for her to stand on. 
And often in our indoor environments, the only suitable standing surface for the cow is inside the stall because it's a soft, dry surface. And if you look at the rest of the barn, uh, what you'll see is typically concrete, often concrete covered in manure slurry. And this is a very caustic, damaging environment for the cow's foot. Uh, finally, on the right there, we see a behavior which you should never see, but you will, in any kind of uh, indoor uh, uh, cubicle uh, environment, and that's the cow standing half in, half out. Sometimes we call that perching in the, in the dairy world. Um, and what's bad about that? Well, the bad part is not where the front feet are, but where the back feet are. So that means those back feet are, again, standing on concrete, standing on wet concrete, standing in manure slurry. Okay. Okay, uh, so uh, one of the things is we are going to think about monitoring how the cow uses her facility. We can sense whether you've got a good fit between the facilities we create and what the animal do does. We need to actually find ways of recording that systematically. Just over the past 10 years now, there's all sorts of really good technical ways of recording, for example, how much time the cow spends lying down in your stalls. And so I've got a slide here just showing a little, one little logger. It's about the size of a, of a, of a cigarette lighter. Uh, it costs about $30. And you can tape it on the cow's leg for a week or so, and you get beautiful data in terms of how much time the cow's lying down. Um, sometimes you will meet people as you enter the world of designing indoor environments that will tell you there are other ways of accurately assessing how the cow is using her environment. And I'll give you a couple of examples of things you shouldn't do. Um, I, here are two cow-friendly ways of assessing, um, uh, 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 or theoretically farmer-friendly ways of assessing um, cow comfort. One's called the cow comfort index, which is just you walk through the farm, you count the number of cows lying down in the stall, uh, and you divide it by the total number of animals touching the stall. That means including those animals which are in somehow contact with cells but not lying down, and that the ratio of the, that somehow is supposed to tell you about the cow comfort. Another measure is the stall use index, which is the total number of animals lying down again, divided by the total number of animals in the pen not feeding. I think this comes from this idea that the cow should be doing two things. They either should be eating at the feed bunk, or they should be, um, or they should be uh, lying down. Uh, neither of these indicators work very well, so I'll show you in the next slide. But uh, the imp interesting thing about this number is it really comes from this, I think, old-fashioned, wrong-headed idea that cows don't just spend time standing in our environment doing neither of those things. And this comes back again to why I think we often mismanage the standing environment for cows, and that's a really important risk when it comes to lameness. Uh, so, oh, went the wrong way there. There we go. Um, and so this next slide just shows you why these in, uh, those uh, various indexes I showed you earlier don't work. So here we have cow comfort index on the, on the bottom axis and versus a real measure of line time as recorded using those uh, data loggers I told you about earlier. And you can see there's absolutely no relationship, which tells you if someone says that they can come and solve your cow comfort measures by calculating something like cow comfort index, just have them walk away. <laughs> And the next slide shows you the same data, but this time for the stall use index. And again, no relationship at all. So uh, there, and this is maybe a message we'll return to a couple times over the course of the talk. Sometimes it seems like there's easy solutions to these things, and those easy solutions are almost always wrong. So next slide, please, Erica. OK, so now, so now we've got ways of assessing how cows are using their environment. Let's initially concentrate in terms of the line surface and how much time the animal spends lying down. We've done dozens of experiments in terms of trying to get that, that cubicle environment to work well from a line time perspective. What you see here is some of our stalls uh, using a surface that one of our preferred surfaces, which is deep bedded sand. And this is when I sort of, when I go to sleep at night and I dream about my cows. This is what I, the way I dream the cubicles are going to look like, which are beautifully raked, flat sand. And the problem is with sand surfaces, or indeed with any bedded surfaces, is that the cows go in and they muck it up, right? So if we go to the next slide, uh, Erica, what you'll see is this is, these are basically topographical maps. Um, which show elevation, but they show it in reverse. So this is, uh, it, 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 the darker lines show the deeper parts of the stall. 
And this is that same beautiful stall I showed you, but you go and look at it after three days and you sort of map it out, and then after six days and after nine days. And you can see after nine days you get the sort of black hole of Calcutta effect, right? And, and what, what I wanted to show you this example is, is about the importance of betting, but also how sometimes these solutions aren't about paying money for equipment, they're about management. And so this is the same stall, and it depends how often you go in, you rake that stall level. And so this is a question that, that drove our, um, our farm manager were bonkers because he had these beautiful stalls. And what we went and did is we went and dug them out to ask the cows the question, how much does it really matter to the cows, right? So if you go to the next slide, Eric, it shows you this experiment. We actually have, and, and I should be saying, I, I'd say we in, in this presentation really depended upon this huge crop of wonderful students that have come through our group over the past many years. And this is one particularly dedicated student, Michelle Jisler. And what she did is she went, she took that topographical map, and then she would, every day, randomly, she'd have to go in and she'd have to apply a treatment to a stall, where she'd dig the stall out to look like one of these three treatments. And that way, you could go in and get asked for a, a group of cows and say, okay, what are, how do these cows respond on a day six day or a day three day or a day nine day? So if you go to the next slide, you see how, how they respond. So on the y-axis, we have line time, shown over 24 hours. These are, are dry cows, non-lactating cows. They typically spend a bit more time lined because they don't have to be milked. So you can see an average of about 13 and a half hours of line time. That's in the perfect condition. That's when the stalls are beautifully level. And this is, again, these are just the same stall. I haven't spent any money. All I've done is just not maintain them. You go in after the three-day section, the six-day section, and the nine-day section, and you see about a two-hour difference in line time. Same stall. Now, I mean, partly because we're a suspicious lot and we never trust the result of one experiment, but also what I showed you in that initial topographical map, that was just the average stall. Well, you can imagine that some of those stalls are a lot worse than average. So what we did is we repeated the experiment. Go to the next slide, Erica. And in this case, we used a wider range, showing not just the averages, but the averages plus one standard deviation. And again, you can see this beautiful, nice linear decline where you can change a cow from lying down about 13 and a half hours to lying down about 11 hours just by failing to maintain the salt. So take home message here is that, and it's probably the most important message in any kind of indoor system is bedding, bedding, bedding. That's what's important. And it isn't always just a matter of buying in fancy looking hardware. It's really good management is where a lot of this comes down to. Next slide, please. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about um, the, uh, the line surface. Um, what about other ways in which cows interact with their environment? And I already told, sort of hinted to you that, that when we think about bringing cows indoors, we don't just have to worry about where they lie down but also where they spend time standing. And here's another uh, pretty picture here of a couple sad-looking cows uh, perching in uh, some stalls. Um, there's a couple things you can see straight away. One, they have the uh, unbedded mattress system, automatically not going to be a very attractive place for the cow to lie down. Um, but uh, there's another big driver in terms of that perching behavior, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you what that is in the course of the next series of slides. So just to, just to just to so we're all on the same page in terms of what your average uh, cubicle looks like and some of the key design features to look for on that. I've got just a little map here of a of a of a typical stall. Um, we have a rear curb, and the idea of that is to basically keep the bedding in the stall uh, and keep the newer from the alleyway out of the stall. Uh, we've got some kind of a, of a stall base uh, and then covered in this case of this slide with copious amounts of bedding, although sometimes people will use mats or mattresses instead. Um, there may also be some kind of a brisket board towards the front end of the stall. And the idea with this is, a, is to index the cow so the cow doesn't lie too far forward. The idea behind that is that if you, and this is this idea that if all of our cows were the same size, if all of our stalls were built perfectly, and we only had one size of cow, and every cow would lie down, and she would be perfectly fitted. It would be a tailored stall, so that only her little bit of her back end's hanging over. So if she happens to defecate or urinate while she's in the stall, it goes in the alleyway, but the stall stays clean. Now, of course, our, all cows aren't the same in the barn, and not, indeed, all stalls aren't even built the same when they go in in the first place. So this can cause problems. Yeah, another area that can cause problems. You look straight up from the brisket board, as you see this neck rail. And again, the idea of the neck rail is the idea that we're indexing the cow. When she walks in the stall, if she walks too far in, and actually when cows tend to mostly defecate and urinate is when they first stand up. So when the cow stands up, 
the idea is that she just backs out enough so again she defecates her urinate. Sam, we've just had a question yep. uh, from Melena. Yep. Um, is sand an appropriate bedding material, particularly from a cow comfort perspective? So m my view is that it's it's the best. Uh, but I think the the that that it really the answer to that really depends on what you have available. So actually, I I was a firm uh, uh, proponent of that sand and only sand until I spent a bunch of time on large California dairies. In large California dairies, they use recycled manure. It's a beautiful bedding material. If you're in, Van in, in California where the average humidity is 0%, it turns into this beautiful fluffy stuff. They put it out in the sun, and it's free. So the average California dairy uses a ton of beautiful free bedding. And so for them, that's a good choice. Uh, so I really think I'm not too prescriptive about what people use as bedding, as long as they use lots of it. And, and your thoughts on mattresses? So the, the, uh, every time you meet somebody who sells equipment, they will tell you that I've got this year's mattress is the one that solves the problems with the previous mattresses, and that these mattresses won't cause the injuries, which I'm going to talk about in a, little, in a few minutes, um, and won't increase rates of lameness. Uh, and if you find such a if find such a salesman and you agree to put it in, make sure that they're uh, that this comes with a money back guarantee. Is all I would say on that. Because okay. after working for many years with mattresses, I have yet to see one which is or in, in, any type of non bedded surface mats, mattresses, water beds. Uh, they all come with increased risks in terms of reduced cow comfort just in terms of line time, and also in terms of increased injury risks. And that's probably the most, if you wanted to find a result in all of dairy sciences, which is the most repeatable and solid, I would say that would be one of the, 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 the most uh, strongest results we have out there in all of dairy sciences. If you put a mattress in front of a cow, you're going to have problems. <laughs> um, so yeah, so you've got to sense a little bit, of course, the salt partitions themselves can also get in the way in the cow. And I think the take home message in terms of looking at this picture of the stall is for you to realize that everything you put in front of the animal, you're doing it for your benefit. Uh, the, all that hardware, if the cow has a choice, she'll always lie down in an area where there's less hardware. If the cow has a choice, she'll always avoid a solid surface, especially a concrete surface. And so we as engineers tend to love concrete and we love stainless steel because it's hardy. Uh, but that's, it's, it's, we really need to realize that we're not doing that for the animal's benefit. So you're really thinking about how do I minimize use of these materials so I still get a comfortable environment while still working for me as in, in my production system. Dan, just another quick question yeah. here. Uh, Victoria is just asking, are all sand types okay or are there some sands that are not suitable? Excellent question. Thank you very much for that question. Uh, no, just like anything else, uh, any other bedding surface for sure, bedding type for sure, they're not all in the, all uh, created equally. Um, what you want to think of one of the biggest advantages of sand is that it doesn't hold water. Uh, and so if you get a if you get a, a glass full of water and you pour it on sand, you should be able to come back a minute later and stick your hand on the sand surface and then your hand not get wet. That means if you're using a really silty sand, that's not going to work. So we use washed river sand. Uh, you also need to watch for the particle size in, in sand. So ideally, you're also using a screen product. So you don't have big rocks in there, which of course can be a cause of traumatic injuries. So yeah, the, the supplier of your sand is very important. Thanks for that. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Erica. So here's just an experiment, just looking at one of those features. And again, we've actually done dozens of experiments looking at all of these different elements of sort of that space we create around the cow to look at what the effects are. Almost always the answer is the more the hardware, the less the cow likes it. And this is just one example of how that works. So here on this axis, on the x-axis, the bottom axis, we have the distance from the neck rail to the curve. Okay, so in other words, how much space the cow has to walk in the stall before she comes up against that piece of metal. And, and we've got two different lines. The line at the bottom is how much time does she spend standing fully in the stall. You just look at that line in the, to begin with. What you can see is when we have that neck rail in this very aggressive position, it's just 130 centimeters from the rear curve, the cow can't, none of our cows can fit in the stall at all. 
So they, none of them spend any time standing for the stall because they can't fit in. Uh, as you make that stall more generous, so you push that neck rail back a few centimeters at a time, cows will spend more and more time standing in the stall. It's just a nice linear response on that bottom white dot in terms of how it responds. Now you look up at the perching. And we said before the reason we don't like perching is because the cow's standing with their back feet in the manure slurry. How do we prevent cows from perching? We give her a comfortable place to stand. So again, we have the very aggressive position. We get lots of perching. We make it less aggressive, and we reduce the amount of perching. OK. Now, so far, all the sounds, you might be sort of, hopefully you're nodding your head and saying, oh, that sounds great. But really, do I care about how much perching? Or really, do I even care about how much time the cow's standing in the stall? Uh, for some of you, at least, you might be interested in, in, in other kinds of outcomes. And so if you just go to the next slide, Erica, one of, the, one of the things we've been really interested in is the extent to which building good environments results in, um, in good health outcomes for the animals. And so I'm going to just tell you a little bit about what we know about some injury and health outcomes for our cows. And so this is a picture of a sort of a typical mattress housed cows. And how do you know she comes from mattresses? Erica? The lesion? She's got lesions on her hawk. Yeah, yeah. So easy to pick them out. If you want to go to the cell yard, you want to know which cows came from a mattress barn, that's how you pick them out. Uh, and actually, if you look carefully, she's got two different types of lesions. She's got a big lesion on the surface of her hawk. That's a real mattress sore. She's also got smaller lesions on the inside of the point of the hawk there. Those are actually caused by coming in contact with the surface of the rear curb, so a poorly finished cement surface. Uh, and this cow, the, in this case, the poor cow managed to get them both. Uh, so just go to the next slide, and I'm going to show you how we put these things together. So here's an experiment. This is actually one of our barns. And we've got all these groups. It's a big barn, 270, uh, 288 stalls actually in this barn. But we've got it set up in little groups of 12, or we can do. So what you can see in this first little grouping in front of you, we've got that neck rail at the aggressive position. The next group, we've put at the neck rail at the generous position. The next one, you keep on looking a little further down, you can see it's at the, at the, at the aggressive position. Next one down, generous. Imagine that going all the way down in front of you and back behind you, too. So we've got the whole barn set up like this. Then what we do, again, this is because we've got all these free, wonderful students. Students in there, they keep the cows there. Cows and the students work happily together for a number of weeks. And they're, what they're doing in this case, they're monitoring gait. They're watching for differences in gait score and laying this in these cows over time. And then after they've waited five weeks, the students have to go in there with their ratchets. And they go and they change all of the stalls around. So this one that was in the aggressive position becomes generous. The one that's in the generous position becomes aggressive. And you keep on monitoring those cows for another five weeks. OK, next slide, Erica. So here you go, one of our groups. This is half of our pens in our barn. Uh, on the left-hand axis, we have gate score. In our system, a three is clinically lame. A four is severely lame. We're picking our cows. So all of our cows are going in at the same average level here. They're all coming in at three. And you can see over time that these cows that are initially is in this 130, this aggressive uh, uh, neck rail position, they become more lame. A week five, you change treatments, and all of a sudden they get better. Now let's look at those other half of our stalls. So the cows that started off, the next slide, in the generous position, those cows get better over time until, of course, the students go in and make the stalls aggressive, and then they get worse. So it's just one feature, right? So don't get, don't obsess over neck rail position, but it just shows you how just getting one thing right makes a difference in terms of lameness outcomes. It makes a difference in terms of what the cows are doing. And that all makes sense in terms of what we know by exposing cows to more time standing on wet concrete. OK, so I, I told you so far about all these beautiful experiments that we can do in our uh, in our freestall facility, uh, in our experimental facility. But one of the frustrations, I think this is you go talk to researchers anywhere, and they'll say the same thing, is they do these beautiful experiments. But for some reason or other, the, you know, the farmers aren't reading the Journal of Dairy Science. You know, so that they're getting the information that, that, that you know, or at least you think you know, out there to work on commercial farms is always a challenge. And so more and more, what we've been doing is, is doing a research on, on the farms. And, 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 and there's a couple reasons for this. One is the one I just said, but also that, yeah, that we talk about, let's say, I said earlier, the cows spend about 12 hours a day lying down. Well, I said that for my cows, but for your cows and your farm, how much time do they spend lying down? Well, you just don't know, probably, because you're not out there measuring it. 
Uh, moreover, I showed you that for our farm, something like neck rail really neck rail position really mattered. But I think we've got already a very well designed farm. For example, we're not using mattresses. We've got a very a good bedding management routine and other kinds of aspects. Uh, so the the vulnerable point, the, 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 the risk for your farm might be different than the risk for my farm. And that's one of the reasons we switched to doing much more work on farms where we basically try to give farmers their own data about things like line time, about lameness, and allow them to try to work together with their sort of trusted colleagues, their veterinarians, their nutritionists, et cetera, to come up with solutions for their own farms. So on this, on this slide, it shows some of the regions that we've worked in. Uh, up in the top left-hand corner, that's home for me. That's British Columbia. I talked a, a minute ago about some of the uh, big farms in California we've worked at. We've also worked uh, on farms in other parts of uh, Canada and the United States. Okay, just go to the next slide, Erica. Um, and it doesn't really matter what region you go into. It, you're always going to see something like this. And I'm sure if we went and did the same study here in Australia, we'd find same kind of pattern. So here we've just ranked farms from best to worst. So on the y-axis, we have the percentage of cows that are scored as clinically lame. And on the x-axis, this farm number going from best to worst. So you can see this is farms from, 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 from my backyard, uh, including our own farms on this, is on this graph. Uh, and you see the best farms, about 5%. And then we've got a fairly sort of even increase up there to about a 35 percent and then there's a dog leg where there's some farms having a really you know the the, the bottom seven or eight farms are having real problems in in, in our region now so I'll just tell you a, a second so the bc farms those are cow, those are farms on average let's say 150 milking cows all free stalls all whole thing uh but smaller kind of farm uh now we go to california average herd size in for these dots i'm showing you are about 2500 cows uh, all Holstein, <laughs> all free stall, but there's some. Uh, but you can see that despite the the differences in um, in farm size, the lameness risks are about the same. So almost identical pattern where we've got this steady increase in a bit of a dog leg. Final region I'll show you are for farms in northeastern United States. Uh, so this is mostly New York, but also Pennsylvania, Vermont, and you can see again the dog leg, but the dog leg's turned upside down. So they have a few farms that are doing okay, and then a bunch of farms that are struggling. And we'll talk in a minute about why some of those regional differences, but also the differences within region that we've obviously been really interested in. So I mean, the, the key thing I should say about collecting this kind of data is we can give every farmer that participates in this kind of study, we give them their own individual report. And they know how much time the cows lie down. They know which cows have hawk lesions, which cows are lame, all that kind of stuff. And they also see that data in relation to their neighbors. So a guy in California can compare his farm with a bunch of other California farms that are facing exactly the same economic constraints, et cetera. Um, the, uh, so so, so that's, that's, the, that's the good news from the producer's perspective. And then that sets up this nice conversation where the farmers are able to hopefully do some troubleshooting. But in addition, we as researchers then get to collect the raw data to see well, what allows some farms to succeed and other farms not to succeed. Um, so uh, if, you, uh, if we go to this next slide now, what you can see is just one of the features that really comes out as important. And this is now for those New York farms where we have the highest levels of lameness. In New York, we have a lot of people using mattress-based farms. Uh, but there's also a lot of people using uh, deep bedding. And what we find is that the people using deep bedding have a lot less lameness. Now, uh, when you use deep bedding, you tend to also in New York State be using sand bedding. So sand bedding and deep bedding go together. It's hard to separate those out because there's very few people using deep bedding with other things. We also measured bedding moisture and uh, sand bedding tends to be dry. So these are dry deep salts that are, tend to be sand. Uh, interesting thing, this is something to keep you uh, Aussies happy. Next slide is that the other big productive factor is just having the cows outside. I should say though, in this case, that these are cows from, that all of the milking cows are inside all the time. This is just cows having access to pasture during the dry period. It's still having a protective effect. So just some time of getting the cows outside can have really powerful effects in terms of cow comfort. So something to think about, even if you are using indoor systems or using uh, indoor systems for part of the time is how can I incorporate some outdoor access? Because even a period of outdoor access can 
can be very positive. Okay, I, I, I told you a little bit of the lameness, but I have to talk about hot lesions as well because they're just so they're just so common in our indoor systems, and they're so easy to fix. <laughs> One reason I think they're easy to fix is if you, and again, the thing we were talking about a little earlier today, is this, uh, this problem of farm blindness. I mean, there's things that you just don't notice because they're just always there on your farm. And this is the case for these lesions. The way I notice these lesions is we've got a big farm. People can come visit our farm whenever they want. And some smart ass went around our farm, took a bunch of pictures of our cow's legs, and sent the folder of photographs to my dean. So my dean calls me and says, so weary, uh, why your cows all have these sores on their legs? I said, oh, well, what do you mean? <laughs> OK, anyway, so th that's what got me focused. It was something that was just common as could be, and I didn't even notice it. So it is something that you, you need to be looking at your cows' legs. This is easy just to be looking at and scoring the cows, walk through the market, milking parlor. This is just one very simple scoring system where you see a, a bald patch and a bit of swelling as a score two, and a score three is 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 uh, is considerable swelling and often a bit of an open wound, and those are both common in in, in these kinds of uh, indoor systems. If you go to the next slide, here we see again that comparative data. Again, you see the three regions. Again, you see some farms are able to really keep these under control. So again, same economic, same environment. Some farms down there at zero percent, and other farms at basically a hundred percent of their cows. This is just whether they have two or greater. So. Uh, these are cows with some kind of a, of, a, of a noticeable lesion. And again, you see the bulk of the problems happening in the Northeast. And again, that's because they're using mattresses. And if you just go to the next slide, Erica, this slide tells that story of, um, of uh, sort of the various risk factors. Um, and we're doing that looking, now we're looking at an odds ratio. Is basically, what's your chance of having one of these lesions? We're doing that as a reference of mattress, because mattresses are the worst. And you put them in comparison to other kinds of systems. As I said before, deep bedding and sand bedding and dry bedding, those are all basically the same farms. Um, and if you're doing deep bedding, your chance of having a hawk reason goes down by 20-fold. This is, you, you don't get better than that. So it's one of these things where it's actually, this is a common problem, but it's actually a problem that you can manage for it. And the reason, way you manage for it is make sure you can't see any non-bedded surface when the cow's lying down. Uh, other, uh, thing I have in there is pasture access because again, pasture access is highly protective. If you've got hawk lesions, you put cows outside for a while, they're going to come back in, they're not going to have hawk lesions. And with that pasture access, Dan, what, what bedding do they have in their barn? So see, this is, I mean, that's the, the, the funny thing about this. The barn hasn't changed, of course. Yeah. All you've done is you've given the cows a rest period basically outside. Uh, so the, uh, the, the, that sample of farms will have had a, 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 will have had a combination of, of both mattresses and non-mattress surfaces. And in this case, what I'm doing is I'm showing you, I mean, this is a multivariable, oh, I actually think these are univariable relationships. But even if you statistically control for the effect of the, let's say, if they are using deep bedding inside, that the, the pasture actor still comes out of the same OK, just the last thing I wanted to tell you about some of this benchmarking stuff is that I think it can really work as a way of motivating farmers to notice different things. Uh, and I think one thing you can think about this yourself is the advantage of just spending time recording some data on these things that you might want to manage for. And so if you're thinking about using indoor systems or if you are using indoor systems, you need to be systematically recording things like hawk lesions and lameness. And as soon as you start doing that, you're going to notice these things more, which cows have them, when are they most prevalent in different times of the year. But also, you can then compare your data both with yourself over time, but also with other farms. So here, what we've just done is taken, this is just a subsample of farms. What we found is this benchmarking program has actually been hugely attractive for farmers, and we have this huge waiting list of people who want us to come visit their farms. And I don't know how this group of 15 farms, I've got on this slide, managed to convince the uh, students who are doing this project to go back and revisit their farm, but they did. So this is a group of 15 farms that managed to convince our students to go back twice. This is their initial scores. And you can see this is northeast uh, again. So you can see that most of them are having real problems with their lesions. So most of them are up above 80%, right? This is a very bad situation for hawk lesions. They go back the next year, and this is where those farms are. So 
I can tell you that each of those 15 farms did something a little bit different. And this is the, the, you know, this is the magic, but it's also the curse as a researcher, but it's a cool thing from a farmer's perspective is that the farmers can use that data to make whatever decision they want to do. Uh, some people, uh, they, you know, did, did sort of added a little bit to the curb, so the uh, rear curb, they get a little bit more bedding in. Other people ripped out mattresses. Other people did other management things. But uh, you can see that almost all of the farms were able to achieve some level of success. And some, in some cases, dramatic improvement by just focusing a little bit on this as an outcome. We have similar results for the lameness, but I won't, don't have to show that to you now. Okay, so what I thought, I've told, giving you a lot of sort of sciencey numbers, don't have to show that to you now. Okay, so what I thought, I've told, giving you a lot of sort of sciencey numbers, now this is the exam bit, see if you've been listening. I'm going to show you uh, uh, some, some paired comparisons here, which uh, should illustrate some of the things we've been talking about so far. So I want you to just, I want you to look at each of these slides for a minute and then we'll just sort of walk through them. So, uh, first slide is here, is thinking about it as a line surface for the cows. So, top left hand corner we've got deep bedded sand and the bottom we've got a mattress. Just to make it easier for you, in one of the stalls the cows lying down in the other stall, the cows giving you a dirty look. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, this is to, to uh, reinforcing the point about about um, bedded surface being the really the quality of the bedding and the depth of the bedding being most important factor you can do when it comes to indoor management. Go to the next slide, Erica. Okay. Um, uh, in addition to the what she's lying down on, there's the hardware surrounding her. And so here's uh, two uh, slides. One is actually of our own barn, a conventional freestall with lots of hardware. And in the bottom right-hand corner, you've got an open uh, bedded pack barn there uh, and uh, on straw. And I can tell you, we've done this experiment. Other people have done it. If you, if you, if you gave a door, allowed the cows to vote with their feet between going into one of those environments, the other cows are always going to choose to lie down in the environment with less hardware. So. Um, the, not to say we can't get the hardware to work, but we have to go in realizing the hardware is for our advantage, not for theirs, and we have to manage it right. Next slide, Erica. Okay, this is a, a nice uh, contrast again. So here I'm showing you our own, uh, this, is a, this is our home farm cow outside on a good day, obviously. Uh, uh, out on grass is a very uh, soft, resilient surface for the cow's foot. On the bottom right-hand corner, we have one of our uh, uh, a local farm uh, on concrete indoors, and you can see a nice uh, layer of manure soil. The cows are standing there. So you have to think about that other 12 hours. What is a cow? What is the cow standing on? And if you have cows spending any time standing on a surface, like you see in the bottom right-hand corner, that's putting cows at huge risk from our traumatic uh, type injuries, but also from our contagious uh, injuries. I'm looking at somebody across uh, uh, across from me now. We're talking about digital dermatitis earlier. A, a, a huge risk of standing hours in manure, sorry. And uh, here's another one. So if we don't have cows standing in our, standing outside the stall, then can they stand inside the stall? And, and as I said, typically we've thought about designing our stalls in a way that prevent cows from standing fully in them. And that might be okay if we had another really good area for the cows to lie down, to stand up in, I should say. But we typically don't do that. So again, for you to think about, if you want to build a stall that is difficult to stand in, make sure you've got a really good alternative area for the cow to spend time standing. Um, and we can, I showed you an experiment how you can change cows from standing fully in the stall to standing half in the stall, and that's just by putting, again, the where you position the hardware. So if you go to the uh, the next slide, and actually this is our, uh, well, second to last wrap-up slide. So here, I told you just, I mean, we only had a, a few minutes today, I've just given you sort of a teaser on some of the, some of the results. But this slide, if there's one thing you want to sort of paste onto your herd manager's forehead, this would, this would be it, which is sort of the, all of the, the, the things that, you, that sort of key risk factors to, to poor comfort and lameness. Um, we talked about some of these already and on line surface you want to provide deep surfaces, ideally sand or some other dry, well-maintained bedding surface. Mattresses are a, are, are a severe risk. 
um, uh, as are rubber mats, as are water beds, as is plain concrete, as is anything else you can't keep bedding on. That's the surface. In terms of all around the stall, you want to realize that sort of hardware is the cow's enemy. So use it as sparingly as possible. The cows would prefer an open area or a large free stall with no neck rail and no brisket locator. Um, anything that you put that restricts free standing and line movement, including if you think about that very first uh, video we saw of the cow standing up. Anything that you see the cow banging up against, that's a risk. And then finally, uh, that we're not just thinking, we think about cow comfort, don't just think about what the cow's lying down. Think about that other 12 hours a day. Where are your cows standing? Are they spending any time standing on concrete? Are they spending time standing on wet concrete? Are they standing in manure slurry? Any of those are things, every minute spent in that situation is a risk for you and for the cow. So find ways to avoid that. Uh, interesting, uh, I've talked a little bit about providing well-maintained outdoor access, uh, dry, soft surfaces. Interestingly here, uh, something that people don't often realize, that m automatic scrapers in an indoor facility can actually be a risk because those barn floors are built relatively flat uh, because scrapers don't work unless there's a bit of moisture on them. So the engineers have built those so that you can get a good scrape when it happens. That means that every time the scraper's not going, the cows are standing in a wet surface. Dan, we've had a couple of questions just about um, not standing in the stall. Yeah. So I might just sort of summarise a couple of them. Um, but what are the alternatives um, and what type of bedding should they be standing on if they're not standing in the stall? So should there be a separate area for them? And if so, what should be on that surface? Okay, I should be clear about this area. So it's not like... I mean, hopefully I'm saying this to you guys are sort of problems to avoid, not like we've got all these problems solved in our North American herds. In fact, quite the opposite. So we're, we're suffering with the poor design choices of many of these things. And I think it's really the case when it comes to standing areas. We don't have it solved. What people have been playing with the various degrees of success include putting some kind of a rubberized surface on especially high traffic areas. So many people use rubber in the holding areas, for example, in front of the parlor. Some people use rubber also in front of the feeders. Uh, the problem with rubber is much like the problem with concrete or indeed with any other surface, is that not all rubber is created equal. And so sometimes rubber can actually be very slippery, other kinds of problems with it. Um, but that's something to think about. Again, not a huge level of success, but something. Some of the m more creative people have actually thought about creating actually a feeding stall. So it's something that looks sort of like a, a free stopper lying down, but is much shorter, so the cow couldn't lie down on it. What you're doing though is you, what you've done is you created a surface which is raised without a manure slurry. You could, there is an excellent place, unlike the line stall, here is an excellent place to have a mattress or a mat. So a little bit of resilience, but dry, a little bit of resilience, and the cows are spending about four hours a day in front of here. So that's a very smart place to focus a bit of investment in terms of uh, a, a good sunny area. I guess though, I mean, the, the biggest message on that would be uh, and this is something that we've been, been working uh, uh, a great deal on in our systems, is try to find ways of incorporating some kind of free choice outdoor access to cows so that they can access an, either an outdoor pack or some area of pasture when they want to. And that gives them a rest period off the concrete. And, and I think there's a lot that individual farmers can do in terms of experimenting with different ways of managing that. The one thing I would say don't do, and which is of course the one thing that we do often see, is a big chunk of concrete. <laughs> because yeah, simply exposing the cows to more concrete is not likely to be the problem. It's not likely to be the solution. One of the nicest examples is again these big free stalls in California where they have these lots of manure bedding, is they put these big piles of dried manure out there and the cows love it. Cows so they actually this is this is what pasture looks like in California is a big dry lot area essentially, but with a big mound of, uh, a bedded mound which works beautifully for the cows. Uh, if you just go to the next slide, I've got a, I've just got a uh, wrap up for you there, Erica. So just got three very simple points here that I want you to, it, when all this is done, if, if you ask by your, by your children or your spouse when you get home tonight what you learned. So the first one is, um, that keep your eyes open and, and I, for your own farm, if you already have indoor housing, if you're thinking about this, when you go visit other people's farms, look for these contacts between the animal 
and the facility to look for these lesions. You'll see these hawk lesions I talked about. You'll see the neck lesions I talked about. You'll see all these other kinds of weird lesions on the pins and other parts of the cow. These are all hardware disease. These are all problems with the cows contacting with the environment in ways they shouldn't. And you shouldn't see them. If the system is well designed, you shouldn't see them. Next slide. So if you watch the cows interact with the environment, you'll see where the stall is built too aggressively too. If the cows are banging up against different surfaces. Um, you can also be, and this is if, if you're working with a manufacturer who's interested in selling you something that they say works well from the cow comfort, ask them for some numbers. Collect your own numbers on things like lesions that you can see. But in terms of line time, this is something that any professional gets you. And I think it's a very convincing thing if you're thinking about doing a change in your own facility. You can see the difference of making some of these changes in terms of the cows lying down more. And finally, bedding, bedding, bedding. <laughs> so I, I hope that was of some help, Erica. Yeah. And uh, yeah, as a, uh, if you, anybody's got any questions at all, we'd be pleased to to answer them in the in the next uh, ten minutes or so we have available. Yeah, that was fantastic. Thanks, Dan. Um, so we do have a couple of questions just sitting here at the moment. So from Scott, uh, you mentioned the cow's preference for loose housing in bedded barns. Can you talk through the trade-off, uh, space per head, bedding requirements, etc.? Um, so I, I think you mean, Scott, that it's sort of a completely open pack versus a cubicle or a stall type environment. Uh, so typically, the amount of the amount of uh, of space per cow you need in a, in a in an open area, an open pack, would be twice as much, at least, as you need in a in a cubicle. So that's that's the cost. I mean, you're you're saving money in hardware, but you're spending money on on roof space, I guess. Um, and I, you know, it's going to depend on your builder in terms of how the, how all that works out. Um, one of the biggest ongoing costs for the farmer is of a more open system is more management in terms of the bedding. Uh, the cows, if you've got an open area, the cows are going to defecate and urinate in the bedding, and that means you need to be on top of your bedding management. I showed you some slides earlier today showing you need to be on top of your bedding management anyways. Um, but I think this is. You know, this is finding the right system for you as a producer. I, I think those open bedded pack systems work really well for our, for the the cow man, the real cow centric guy who who doesn't mind spending time out in the barn getting it getting that environment to look just right. Uh, if you're someone who wants sort of your the hardware to solve your problems for you, then then you want to be then that's where the cubicle is going to provide you some advantages. But as I said before, you have to realize, don't say you're doing this for the cow, because you're not. You're doing it for yourself. Um, uh, it's the the uh, a more open area is going to work better for cow comfort, but it's going to require more labor in terms of management. One final point on that, Erica, is that I think that this is and this is something actually uh, uh, to think about within the herd. In our herd, we're using already sand bedding. We've got a very good level of utter health. So our problem in our herd isn't mastitis. Now, it's not to say we don't have mastitis cases. Of course we do. But I, if you look at the numbers, we've got a much bigger problem with lameness than we do with mastitis. So I don't have any problem telling the, convincing our farm staff and our farm that, look, what we need to do is, is go easy in terms of creating more generous stall designs. That might end up with a few more manure patties in the back of the stall. But that any additional risk in terms of utter health is more than compensated by the improvements in terms of cow comfort and lameness. But you might go to another uh, farm where really what they're struggling with is just very high rates of uh, sort of infectious type um, uh, of, of uh, environmental type of, of mastitis. Uh, and you know, in that case, you know, then then it's keeping cows away from lying in their manures might be the what they really need to be focusing on. So again, I think it comes back to this idea of really thinking about this benchmarking approach, working individually with farmers to identify the problems on their farm, and then coming up with cow comfort solutions that, that make the right fit. Okay. Um, question from Phil. What's the minimal depth of sand and of straw that you regard as suitable bedding? So that to me, the 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 answer there is if you can see the if you can see the surface underneath the bedding, you don't have enough. The advantage of sand is it's an awful lot harder to when the cow goes in and out of the stall, it's an awful lot harder for it to push it all off. So take as the case the the worst case scenario is a mattress where there's sort of a skiff of straw on top. 
looks great. Cows are off being milked. You have that set up. The first cow that goes in, she goes off. All of a sudden, you walk by your, that's immediately going to fail the test. You're going to see bald patches of mattress. If you have the same level of sand on the mattress, that sand's going to take a lot longer to move off. So even as little as uh, five centimeters of sand can be, if it's well maintained, can, in the sense that the cow doesn't know what's underneath it, can be fine. Uh, if you're using something like straw or uh, sawdust that we often use, you need more than that because it just gets pushed away more easily. Um, in our system where we have many producers that actually use deep bedded sawdust, what you get is you get sort of nice, light, fluffy sawdust on top. As you go deeper down, it gets basically more solid. And, uh, but again, the cow never really knows what's underneath it all if it's well maintained. Okay. Um, just a question here from Elena again. Uh, shouldn't the system be, by definition, be cow-centric? So, you know, if this is a balance, if this has got to, there's no point saying it's going to be, this system is going to be perfect for the cows. It needs to be perfect for all the people that are using, all the, all the creatures that are using the facility. And come up with something that's perfect for the cows that the farmer can't manage, it's not going to stay that way. Or if you come up with something that's perfect for the cows and it's uneconomical for that farmer, that farmer's not going to stay in business. So, no, I, I think it's, I mean, it's what makes agricultural work hard, but it also is what makes it interesting. Is it's got to it's got to work from all these fronts, and I think also, and I, I, I do think this is the, again this issue about coming up with the right solution for the right farmer. You want the farmer it to be a pleasure for somebody to spend time in their barn with their cow, and I know that's one of the things which drives you know why farmers invest in some of our cow comfort research is they want they want to feel good when they go and look at the cows, and. You know, if, if somebody feels good and that's because they haven't noticed cow lesions and all of a sudden they start noticing cow lesions and they don't feel so good, I don't mind that. But what I want them to be doing is to have a path to feel good. And I, I, for this, it's, I mean, I do think there's, there's an easy solution. There's, it's not that it's expensive. It's not that it's hard. You just got to do it. Uh, for things like lameness, this is an ongoing thing. And this is a huge frustration for those of us in using how systems is, uh, is you know we're not we're not lameness is a big problem when you bring cows inside because they're standing on concrete and they're standing on wet concrete. We're not going to solve it. We can make it better, and when we make it better, we're going to make it better for the farmers. I'm um, just going to double back. There was a question a bit earlier from um, Philip. Uh, just ask your opinion of using dry manure as bedding in free stall barns. Yeah, I think, it, as I said, it can be a great surface. It really depends upon how it's done. So wet manure is a horrible material. And dry manure turns into wet manure awfully quickly. <laughs> so <laughs> so you, this, is not, this is not a low management system either. It can be a low cost system if you've got the right conditions. And I would have thought, you know, in Victoria today, it might be not such a good system. I imagine in other drier parts of Australia, it could be a really good system in, for at least parts of the year when, when uh, you get that, those mineral solids to dry out really quickly and the inside environment actually stays quite dry. So I, I'm a fan, and it sounds gross having cows on their own manure, right? But this is not raw manure. This is actually when you work with the material, if it's well treated, it's a lovely, soft, organic material. And it's because it's free, then we can be generous with it inside the barns. Okay, great. Um, if anyone has any other questions, um, just type them in now, because otherwise we might finish up fairly soon. We'll just give a couple of seconds if anyone has any questions. None popping up. Well, thanks very much uh, for presenting that to us today, Dan. I, I hope everyone uh, got a lot out of it. I certainly did. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us um, and providing questions. And this will be up on the Dairy Australia website to view later or to pass on to other farmers that may have missed out. All right. Thanks very much, Dan. Thanks, Erica.